Uh, good evening. We're continuing the Talmud series. Today it's number 44. And uh, a preview from last week's lecture. We spoke about Rabbi Yochanan that was sitting in the gate of the mikveh. And the women who goes into the mikveh look at his face, which means it's influenced the look of the baby when he's going to be born. So from here we learn that what the pregnant woman is looking at, it's affecting her pregnancy for good or for bad. And they ask Rabbi Yochanan, you're not afraid of Ainara? And he said, I'm from the descendants of Joseph. Joseph is protected. He got the blessing from his father Jacob. This is where we ended last week. Today, we're continuing. We're still in the Gemara in Masechet, uh, in Masechet Baba Metzia. And this is what it says. It says like this. Uh, one more thing, actually, that we said last week, the story of uh, Lerish Lakish, that he saw Rabbi Yochanan in a lake. He jumped, and then he ended up marrying his, uh, his sister. That's where we ended last week. Uh, then... Uh, Today, I would like to continue from where we ended last week. And uh, the Gemara is speaking about Rabbi Zera, also one of the important rabbis. Kisalik Lara di Israel, when he arrived to the land of Israel, he was in Babylon, in Babel, he arrived to the land of Israel. Yativ me'at anita. He said, 100 days and fast. 100 days. Why did he fast 100 days? Right? That he will forget the Babylonian Talmud and will get used to the way they learn in Jerusalem. Different systems. I don't want to get confused. I have my way, how we were in Babel. I want to get into the head of the Israelis, how do they learn the Torah, the oral Torah in Israel? Then he fast 100 extra days for one reason. What reason? That Rabbi Elazar will not die, which means he will finish his years, not die younger. Then he fast 100 extra days for another cause. What is it? That he won't end up in Gehenom, in hell. The lo nishlot ben nura de Gehenom. Every 30 days, he used to make a trial to himself. Okay, I finish a month. Let's analyze the entire month. What I did good, what I did bad, what I need improvement. So he's checking himself. He's reviewing retroactive. How did I behave the last 30 days? How did he know? Listen good what's going on here. He used to put fire in his oven. The oven over there used to be like you see in a taboon, you know, like when they make the pita bread, they attach it so it's like a hole. It's a hole in a ground. And the side of it, it's either cement or whatever. They, they cover it with ceramic, all kinds of ways. And then they put pieces of wood in the bottom, and they make fire. And that's how it is. And he used to enter and sit inside the oven while the fire is on. Fire is on. And he wants to know. He said, if I get burned, that means something I did wrong in the last 30 days. If I sit there for a few minutes and I don't get burned, that means I'm OK. We are talking now, of course, you have to always remember, some of these stories, are, there are much more secrets into them than what, you, what it sounds like. What it sounds like is it's one way, and the inside of the stories is much, much, much deeper. There are many commentators who explain the secrets of all the Talmud stories, but definitely never should understand it literally the way it is. You understand? Then the Gemara says, 
אמר רב יהודה אמר רב, מה היא דכתיב, מי האיש החכם ויבן את זאת? What is the Torah meant when it says who is the wise guy who would be able to understand? To understand what? ואשר דיבר פי השם אליו ויגדה. The words of Hashem that spoke to him. What? Spoke what? על מה עבדה הארץ? What is the reason that the land was destroyed? What's the reason the land was destroyed? The rabbis, the sages, the prophets, everyone, their time passed and none of them gave the answer. Until HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself, God himself gave the answer. Why? Because they left my Torah. They neglected the Torah that I gave them. And Rabbi Yehuda says, what do you mean? Everyone learns Torah. What does it mean, left the Torah? Everybody learns Torah. Imagine today, today, I don't know, 70, 80% don't even know what the Torah is. But in those days, everyone was learning Torah. So why did God complain? Complain about what? So he says, שלא בירחו בתורה תחילה. Why the Torah wasn't important enough for them. Yeah, they learn. It's like people go to college. Why they go to college? They want to get the, the master degree, whatever. They want to get a job one day. Nobody is interested really in learning. Somebody goes, if he was able to pay, I don't know, X amount of money, whatever the college cost, instead of sitting there five, seven years, if they tell him, just pay the seven years tuition, and you're a doctor. That's it. You don't have to bother with all the learning. What would he say? Yeah, of course, I'll learn from the doctor slowly, slowly, two, three months in the hospital. I learn what to do. I don't know, I'm going to waste now learning all kinds of things. Math. What math has to do with medicine? All the other things I'm going to learn over there, let's not waste my time. Here it's different, but still, the people learn Torah, but they learn Torah because you're obligated to learn Torah. Because God said you must learn Torah, you don't have a choice, you must. So there's a difference of someone who comes every day because there's, what can I do? I have to learn. I don't want to have problems with God. Or that the Torah is all your life. There's many, many answers. What's the meaning that did not make a blessing first? You know, when we go up to the Torah, before we lay in the Torah, before we read, we make a bracha. Bracha before, bracha after. Same thing when you eat. You eat an apple, you make bore priyayets, you finish, you say bore nefashot. So it's blessing before, blessing after. Every fool does it. You don't need to be a rabbi to know it. Every little kid, before his bar mitzvah, already heard it 500 times. Everybody knows it. Even people who are not Shomer Shabbos, once in 10 years, you call them up to the Torah in, in, in some cousin bar mitzvah, most of them still remember from 20, 30 years ago. So what is going on here? Uh, in a generation that the biggest rabbis in the history lived, they didn't make bracha in the Torah? What does it mean here? שלא ברכו בתורה תחילה. So now the Gemara gives all kinds of things, and one of them is like this. כל המקטין עצמו על דברי תורה. Someone who knows a lot of Torah, but he makes himself nothing. No show off, no special uh, outfit, no special hat like the important rabbis, none of these things. Nothing. You, he walks in the street, you don't know, you don't know, you see him in a grocery, he walks with the bags. Mamash like nothing. He knows the whole Torah. No servants, no people who drive him. He doesn't drive in a special driver, take his stuff, this, that. No, no, very simple. Who was like this? Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul. He's already in his 60s. Almost nobody besides his personal students knew about him in the whole world. Why he did such a good job hiding himself all his life that only later the Ashkenazim discover him and from there he became famous all over the world. But he almost made his entire life staying anonymous when in reality he was one of the top three people in the whole world. And he was hiding himself so great that only his personal students were crazy about him. Because they knew he's one of a kind. One in a hundred years, you have someone like this. But even when people saw that he's brilliant, they ask him, who, who are you? Where are you from? Where you teach? Where? 
Where, so he used to say, no, I'm teaching, a, you know, a Ram. You know what Ram means? Ram means I sit on a table with two or three people in yeshiva and teach them a little bit Gemara. He was making 99% of his... He used to get on a bus, the driver didn't know who he is because he wasn't dressed like somebody important. And what big rabbi take a bus, Bechlal? In the previous generation, they were so humbled, they didn't see anything wrong of sitting in a bus, in a crowded bus. Today, you don't really see. Everyone is a big shot today. But Ravolbi, Ravolbi was a very big tzaddik, sitting in a bus, taking the bus. People saw him sitting in a bus, regular. Rav Ben Zion getting on a bus. They offered him a driver from the government, especially after he became paralyzed. All his life, he refused. He didn't want to get a job. He didn't want to get a salary. The religious party in the Knesset, they had a budget. And they want, was looking to, to, to what to do with the money. So they offered him all kinds of benefits. He, he didn't want. Only when he completely became handicapped, then he had a driver coming in and out, driving him a little bit here and there. But most of his years, he make, you look at him in a wedding, you know, when they make Kiddushin, he stands with all the people around like ordinary person. If you wouldn't know who he is, you, you could think he owns the vegetable stores across the street. He get on a bus, the driver throw him a towel, do me a favor, clean the mirror for me, move it left, move it right, and he does it. Imagine. Try to imagine by the goim that uh, Obama came to some city, and I don't know, the driver didn't, is not watching the news, some Amish driver, and he throw a towel to Obama, do, do me, Barack, do me a favor, <laughs> clean the mirror for me. Uh, huh? Uh, he was, he was, you're insulting me? You're giving me a towel to clean your bus? That would be the end of the world here in America. They talk about it for one week and then it was... For him, he didn't look anything bad. He started to clean. There is two kinds of humble people. Real humble and show off. What does it mean? Some people being humble for them, it's a show to gain honor. Which means it's all a show. Pretending I'm humble and all the time looking around what people say and how much they appreciate that I'm humble. And there are people who naturally are 100% humble, which means it doesn't even cross their mind that something is wrong here. You understand the difference? Many of the humble that you think they're humble, fire are going inside their heart when someone disrespects them or call them with a not respectable title. But he, this kind of people, much like nothing, feel like nothing. Which means, the Gemara says, now let's see, Kol HaMaktin, he makes himself very small. Al divrei Torah ba'olam hazeh, na'asa gadol ha'olam haba. God makes sure that in the next world, he makes him huge. So some of the big chachamim, when they go to olam haba, they say, I don't understand. I learned Torah all my life just like this rabbi. He had thousands of listeners, and I had thousands of listeners. So I don't understand why when we got to Olam Abba, he's important and not me. So Hashem will answer, he made himself very small, for real. And you enjoy the, the glory, the honor, the respect. I know how you felt, and I know how he felt, here is the world of the truth. You get for what you deserve to get. You got it? All right, so, we got, we, so far we got it. So it pays to be humble in this world. Someone who makes himself like a slave. I'm a slave of the Torah. What does it mean to be a slave of the Torah? If you're a slave of a person, <laughs> who wants to be a slave of another person? If you're a slave in jail, your life is a nightmare. If you have a horrible boss that rule your life and control your life, it's a horrible life. Some people are slaves of their dogs. Most of them are stupid enough not to even realize how horrible is their life, that they have to go in the street and pick up the bathroom of the dogs, the most filthy animal in the creation. They run after them with their beautiful tie and $10,000 suits in Manhattan with a bag picking up their garbage, taking him to the doctor, this, that. You understand the idea? And they don't even feel how cursed are, is my life that I'm a servant of a cursed animal. They're actually proud 
that they are walking around with their dogs and picking up his garbage and all kinds of things like this. Now, we're not talking about this. When you are a slave, a servant, this is a better word, a servant of the Torah, not only it's not humiliation, that's a great honor. How lucky you are to be a slave and a servant of the right thing. Now, what does it mean to be a servant of the Torah? What does it mean? To be a servant of the Torah means that no matter what are you busy with, the Torah will always come first. You, want, you, you heard that tomorrow they're going to make a lecture. You're going to be the first one. You make sure the chairs are there if there's food. So you set the food on the table. You set the air condition. You clean the place. You pick up the garbage. Everyone goes. You take the garbage. You clean the shul. I don't know, you need flyers, you know there's a shiur, you run for the whole day, you put flyers everywhere, you make phone calls to people. Nobody asks you. Why people have to beg you to do? You have to be a, a biggest fool not to take advantage on this opportunity. If you work, you work. Talking now you have an hour or two. You don't need anybody to beg you. It has to be something that every Jew has to be in, feel an obligation. Why? I am a servant of the Torah. A good servant doesn't wait for every little thing that his master giving him an order. What's the difference between a bad servant and a good one? A good one is looking what to do for you, master. No, give me, give me something. And a bad one is only always looking to avoid work. But in the long run, every master can tell the difference between good servant and a bad one. And what happened, usually, one day when the master died, after 20 years, he had two servants. One horrible and one good, and he had a billion dollars. What normally happened? He writes in his will, 20 million dollars to Reuven, the faithful servant, 20 cents to Shimon, the horrible servant. Now Shimon paid the price for the 20 years being, a, in Hebrew we call it Rosh Katan, small head. There are two kinds of people, Rosh Gadol, big head, small head. What does it mean, big head? Big head means he understands even what he doesn't pay for him to understand. Rosh Katan is like in the Israeli army. You only understand what you don't have a choice, which means if I won't understand what my commander tells me now, I'll be in a jail tomorrow morning. So now I have to understand. So let's press a button, I understand. Ah, this I don't have to understand. I can go around it. I'm dumb. One hour I'm dumb. One hour I'm a genius. Depend on my convenience. This is the difference between a crook slave and a, uh, and a faithful one. So now, when you serve people, no, oh, I understand why you're trying to avoid. But when you serve the Torah, what do you serve? A piece of paper? A book? A scroll? What do you serve? You are becoming the servant of the creator of the world. Why Oshua Benun was the one who took the place of Moshe Rabbeinu? There are so many other Chachamim, 70 other Chachamim, prophets, each one of them is holy. Yoshua wasn't even the top one. Why? He was the real servant of the Torah, cleaning the shul, taking the garbage out, putting the benches. This is the reason why the Torah said that he became the leader after Moshe Rabbeinu and spoke to Hashem. What got him to this position? Besides all the Torah he learned, there were many like him. You, you care. You're a real faithful servant of Hashem. Why? You do even what you don't have to. What you, don't, what you have to, you have to. What you don't have to, that's a big thing. Everybody knows that when, you, let's say you have to pay extra taxes, I mean, they make rules. That's it, the new rule, you have to pay this year an extra 5% tax. People pay this tax, not because they're good people or they're honest or they're decent, because they're afraid to go to jail. They know, <laughs> as soon as they open my file, they know I didn't pay this 5%. What can I do? Someone who, besides the 5%, says, I want to give something for the community. Here is an extra 5%. 5% you want. I see that the CD is in crisis. Let me give an extra 5%. Uh, he is going to be on the news. Nobody else will be on the news. Only the one who gives from his own will. This is what it is. So the Torah says, the Gemara says, the Gemara says 
someone who make himself like a slave for the Torah in this world, when it comes to the next world, he is the most free person in the afterlife. Everyone wants freedom, United States, the land of the freedom. Freedom, 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 and everyone here became slaves of their dogs or of their work, one of the two. But over there, it's real freedom, real freedom. Someone, Agmara says, Rish Lakish, Ava Metzayen Me'arta de Rabbanan. Rish Lakish, he had a vision, and he was walking in the Galilee, in Israel, in the north, and taking a marker and make marks in certain caves and show this is the cave where this rabbi is buried. This is the cave, like putting signs. The cave of this rabbi, the cave of this rabbi, the cave of this. When he arrived to the cave, they used to bury bodies in caves. If you go to, to the north of Israel, you see Abai and Rava inside the cave. Yonatan ben Uziel all the way down in the valley. This is the way it used to be. So when he arrived to the cave of Rabbi Chia, which was a legendary rabbi, he ignored it. So the Rabbi Chia with his soul is already in the afterlife. He's already in the next world, in heaven. So he said to Hashem, Ribbono Shel Olam, master of the world, I didn't learn Torah just as good as this guy that he's ignoring my grave. The announcement was, you learn Torah just like him, but you didn't teach Torah like him. It's one thing you learn Torah, one thing you share your Torah to others. Rabbi Hanina and Rabbi Chia were arguing. Amar le Rab Hanina le Rab Chia be'adi didi kamintz. You you arguing with me? You don't you know that if God forbid today everyone will forget the Torah, I will be able to recreate the entire Torah, everything from my knowledge without missing a detail. I'm able to tell you the whole Torah from the everything by heart from the beginning to the end. So why are you arguing with me? So he's telling him. If the Torah would, was Shalom forgotten from the nation of Israel, right? I was able to return it with my brilliance. So, so he answered him, and you arguing with me? I already made sure that the Torah will not be forgotten. You, if it will happen one day, you will be able to bring it back. I already took steps to make sure that the Torah will stay. What did I do? I put seeds of linen in the ground. Linen, it's like cotton, it's growing. No. And then from that linen, I made nets. Linen is known as stripes that are, are much stronger than wool. That's why the expensive suit, they sew the button with linen. That's why it makes it not kosher. When linen and wool gets mixed, the Torah does not give permission to a Jew to wear it. Why? There's re reasons for it. Well, one of the reasons is because Cain brought linen as a sacrifice, and Evel brought wool from the sheep, and Hashem accepted the sacrifice of Evel, and Cain murdered Hevel from jealousy, and Hashem said the first murder in a creation happened because of a wool and a linen. I make a decree that they can never be mixed. And, I, and there's many other things. Okay, so now, so, okay, so now he make nets. And with these nets, I catch the deer. It's very hard to catch deer. You cannot run after them. It's also very hard to shoot them. So one way is you stand on a tree, the deer walks by, you throw a net on him, it gets stuck to his leg and he falls. And that's how you catch him. And then I take the meat of the deer. After I catch him, I slaughter him, because it's a kosher animal. And I give the meat to the orphans. Kids that, you know, in orphan home, orphanage home, their parents are not around, so, you know, I feed them. And what do I do from the leather? After I slaughter, I, I remove the leather. 
from the letter I make the scroll of the Torah. I make the scroll, I remove the air, there's a whole process. And then I write, I take a feather, or a cane, or a straw, and with that, I write the entire Torah, the five book of Moses. And then I bring it to the city. I brought it. This is, means every, everything he says now, he already did. I brought it to the city. I read the whole Torah and teach it to the children, to the kids. And then I teach the Mishnah, the oral Torah. And that's how I made sure that the Torah will never be forgotten from the nation of Israel. This is what Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Udanasi said in his speech, how great are the actions of Chia. Chia, this is Chia, the special Chia, Rabbi Chia. Amar le Rabbi Ishmael be Rabbi Yossi, you praise him so much. Do you think he was even greater than you? Now remember, Rabbi Udanasi is the one who wrote the Mishnah. And he is the president of Israel. And he is from the descendants of King David. And he was an important person. So he told him, you think that he even went higher than you? Amar, he said, yes. Even greater than my own father, which I am nothing compared to my father. And he was even greater than my father. He said to him, no, 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 don't exaggerate. You're giving him more than what he deserves. Chas v'shalom, cannot be. Why now are we talking about this? Because this is the chia that they didn't mark his grave. Why? After all what he did, it wasn't even enough compared to this Rish Lakish, which was a Baal Tshuva. He used to be an ex-gangster, an ex-criminal, and then became a big chacham. And he gave his life for the Torah and was teaching to others. And he got upset that Rish Lakish was marking all the graves and he skipped his. Even though, of course, it wasn't intentional, but the complaint of Rabbi Chia in heaven to Hashem was, what sin did I make that from all the people that he marked, I wasn't in a list? By the way, 1,500 years later, the Ari Kadosh, the Ari, which is the biggest Kabbalist in the last 2,000 years, he went again in Tzfat and in Galilee, in all the north of Israel, and re-mark all the graves. Everything almost we know today is thanks to the Ari. The Ari, one in a million years you have a soul like this. He, he reached levels that even people that are mentioned in the Torah couldn't get. For instance, we have in the Torah Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, then we have David, Legendary names, everybody know, King David, King Solomon. What was special about the Ari? Nowhere I've seen myself, maybe I'm wrong, but it's worth to check. Nowhere ever I, I saw that even Yaakov Avinu, Jacob, or Abraham, or any one of them, was able to look at the rock, each rock, and tell you what wicked person is reincarnated in that rock, and what's the sin he used to make. Nowhere I've seen that there's any person, any person from Moshe Rabbeinu until now, that was able to look at the person's image in his forehead and tell him all the bodies that this soul was in in the past, all the reincarnation. When a dog killed a kid, he knew who the kid was and who was the dog, and a wicked person reincarnated as a dog, and he used to be a cheater that cheated with his married woman, and this is a mamzer that was born. He was able to explain all the mysteries. If you ever go to Israel, you go to the north, this is the, the legendary cemetery. All the big names are buried there. The Rabbi Yosef Karo, the Rothschild Chan Aruch, Hanayin Shivat Banea, Hanayin, her seven sons. We just cried about her yesterday in a shul, Tisha Be'av. We had uh, some of the prophets, Rabbi El Kabetz, who wrote the Mizmor Lechadodi, the Ari Kadosh, right there. Mamash, all the biggest names. Yes, maybe more than 100 names that are legend in history. Even some of them by the Goim. And look at the big tombstone that on the grave of the Ari Kadosh, it's engraved inside 
a brief summary about his life. Mamash, like, like you, for a minute you were thinking it was King Solomon. And he was able to go and tell you, here, this person is buried here, and this person is here and here, and based on that, we know where the graves are. All the graves you go in Israel today, without him, almost none of them you would know. Because 1,500 years from the time of Rish Lakish, nobody would know already to remember such a thing. Amar Rabbi Yehuda Amarav, everything Avraham Avinu did for the angels that came to him in a custom of Arabs. You know, the angel came to Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu was in the third day after he was circumcised. It's the most critical day after the Brit Milah. It's the third day. And it's a very, very hard day, the hardest day in history. And Avraham is searching for guests. And Hashem sees that he's anxious to have guests. And he sent them these three Arabs, which in reality, they are angels, but nobody knows. It look like people. And the angel comes, and now listen good to what the Gemara says. Everything Avraham did directly to the guest, Hashem paid him directly to his children. Everything he used, a messenger, he gave an order to someone, to one of his servants, you do this, or to his son. Hashem paid him through a messenger. What's the difference? For instance, he ran to the cows to bring three cows. Why three? One cow, it's not enough for three Arabs. How much an Arab can eat? Take the, the biggest Arab in the world. Can he finish 10% of a cow? A cow, it's more than a ton of meat. Even a year it takes to finish it, if you put it in a freezer. So what's the problem? Why does he need three cows? Because he wants to give them the tongue. The tongue is uh, as an important piece. Now, did you ever see the size of the tongue of a cow? You only see from the outside half a feet, I don't know, like 10 inches or something like that. But the truth is that if you go through the throat, if you take it all the way from inside, it's very big. What's the problem? You cut it to three different thirds, and you give each one of the angels a third. The Gemara said, no, it's not the same. The piece inside is very thick. All the way inside the throat is very juicy, much more delicious than the piece outside, which is very thin. It's not fair. Bottom line, he needed three cows, even though, remember now, there's no refrigerator, no freezer. Today, if you have three important guests coming to you and you want to give each one of them a whole tongue, what do you do with the cows? Cut it, you and your messenger, wrap it, 9.99, 10.99, 12.99. You put it by the butcher. You sell it, or you sell it to the butcher, or you put it in the freezer, or you make a big party and you and and, the, and 500 people eat from the rest. But Avram doesn't count, count how much I lose. He wants the Arabs that he finds on the street. Arabs. It's not his brother, his cousin. Arabs from a different nation. He never saw them before. And he goes out and he brings the cow, three cows by himself. He brings them. Okay, so what happened? Because he ran by himself and was a very wealthy man. Let's not forget that. He was one of the richest people in the world, Avraham Avinu, at that point. He's already blessed by Hashem. Even when he bought the Meharat HaMachpela from Ephron, what did Ephron, which was the leader of the Goim, was a very wealthy man, what did he say to Avraham? Here, you can have it for free. You are the president of God among us. Nasi Elohim ata bekirbenu. When we want to ask questions from God, you are the rabbi of the world. Well, you want me, you want to buy it? You want to pay me money? In the end, he ripped him on, on the price. The Gemara said, the wicked people, they talk a lot, and even a little bit they don't do. The righteous people, they talk a little bit, and they do a lot. But the wicked people talk and talk and talk, in the end, I'll call you next week. Next week, when you call them, they don't, they're not available. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's almost always the same story. Anyway, so Avraham ran. He got meat for the guest. When the nation of Israel came out of Egypt, Hashem brought meat for, for the nation of Israel by himself. Where does it say? Veruach nasamet Hashem. Hashem brought wind. There was these birds that flying, it's called slav, very nice, delicious, delicious uh, ch uh, chickens, birds, kosher birds. 
they were flying to one direction. Hashem brought very strong wind, and all of them fell right by the nation of Israel. They picked them up, chopped their head off, and, and ate them. That's called slavin. Then the Torah said, Vaikach chem av echalav. He, t- he took milk from this cow, he make milk, and he also make butter. So he made butter and milk. What does the Torah say? mtir lachem lechem mina shamayim. What did Hashem say? I'm sending you man. Man, Abraham did with his own hand. He prepared for the meal. I'm preparing for you a meal, directly. Then it says, Ve'u omed alem tachat ha'etz. They sitting under the tree, because it's very hot day, remember, the hottest day ever. So they sending in a, they sitting under the tree, and he, the richest guy, standing there to serve them. It's hard to believe. Try to imagine today, take the richest Jew in the world, the richest religi- religious Jew in the world. I know one of them, without mentioning his name. He worth at least seven, eight billion dollars. Some say 10, some say 15. Let's agree on 10. It's, very, it's true, it's true that that particular Jew is very, very humbled as well for his wealth. And in Shabbat, he runs and serves the people. Even though he has six, six servants are helping. But he, he himself, I was one time, I did a Shabbaton in his house. And then so that's the shit. I went to two, I, I took a regular plate. And he got upset. He said, Rabbi, Shabbat. On Shabbat, we eat on gold plates. Gold, real gold. Gold cups, gold plates, lichvot Shabbat. I, I went, I took, I saw uh, plates. I want to take, they have buffet over there. I take a little food. No, 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 ah, right away. Now, I have a little baby. I give him a $10,000 glass. Crystal and gold engraved in, inside. I feel bad. The whole meal, my son's going to knock this guy on the floor. So it's a little baby. He doesn't need. Give him a plastic cup. No, no, Shabbat. Yeah. Eat, break it, I don't care. But even someone like this, if we see three Arabs coming in the desert, let's see he drives with his uh, caravan there somewhere in Morocco, and he see three Moroccan Arabs walking like this well, in the hardest day. He runs, he makes shish kebab for them, he serves them, doesn't know who they are. This guy is crazy. It doesn't make sense. Nobody would think he's a Baal Chesed. Today, people would think it's crazy. Something went wrong in his head. So Abraham is standing and serving them. The same thing the Torah says, Hashem did the same thing to Moshe. No? Then when they walk, Abraham went with them. He walked them out. Hashem olech lifnehem yomam. And Hashem walked the nation of Israel directly. Then Abraham say to the boy, you kach na me'at ma'im, go bring water. That's he didn't do directly. Water. And what did Hashem do? Ve'ikita batzur ve'atzu mimeno ma'im ve'shata'am. Hashem didn't bring the water directly. He asked Moshe to speak to the rock and bring water. Why he couldn't bring water? What's the problem? No, you, Moshe, will bring. Why? Abraham didn't bring the water. He sent someone. I'm sending someone. No, Yafe. Then, for three rewards, for three things that he did, we got three rewards. For chema vechalav, for the butter and milk, we got the man, thanks to that. For standing and serving them, we got the pillar, the, the cloud that showed the way, the, the pillar of fire that shows them the way. GPS, primitive, but divine GPS. Much more reliable than the one today. Make a right, Baka and Garbia. You want to go from Afula to Tel Aviv? In the middle, a big arrow, Baka and Garbia, the GPS. Fne Smola, <laughs> enter Baka and Garbia, a direct journey into, you know where. <laughs> Then you say, no, it cannot be. Ah, it's, it's an Arab village. They slaughter me over there. You continue straight. Then there's another opportunity around to make a U-turn and go back to Baka and Garbia. And the GPS say, make a U-turn. Go again. Maybe the Arabs planted something in the GPS. They want to have guests. I don't know. But bottom line, this is a divine GPS. So 
thanks to what? Why we got it? For what? We got it for the service that Avram gave them. And then, you kachna me'at ma'im, go and bring water. They got the well of Miriam. The well, there was a well. As long as Miriam, Moshe's sister, was alive, there was water. But the day she died, the well got dry. And then the complaints began. Amar Rabbi Anai be Rabbi Ishmael. Avram said, wash your legs. Use the water to wash the legs. Why? One of the idol worshipping ways used to be that they take off the dust from the legs and bow down to it. So, so the Arabs, they told him, you suspecting that we are worship, worshipping this Avodah Zarah? That's why you want us to wash our, our, our legs? Because of that, he had Ishmael, that worship that Avodah Zarah. Ishmael, the father of all Arabs. Vayera elav Hashem kechom hayom. It was a very hard day, and Hashem came to him in the hardest day ever. Mai kechom hayom, the Gemara say. That was the third day of his circumcision. And Hashem came to visit Avraham and see how he's doing. And Hashem took the son out of the shell. By the way, that's one of the proofs that the Torah is divine. Because, because nobody knew, nobody was able to know 2,000 years ago that the sun has a shell. Today, with special equipment, you can prove that the sun is covered with a klipa, with a shell. But David HaMelech, 3,000 years ago, he wrote, L'ashem esam o'el ba'em, Hashem cover the sun. And then Chazal say, in the future to come, Hashem will make a hole in the shell of the sun, and in one second, it burns all the wicked people on the world, all of them, shh, one second. You won't even need an atomic bomb. One second, the energy comes out of the sun and burns the entire world. In case you didn't know, the temperature in the center of the sun is 15 million degrees Celsius, which is about 22 million degrees in the United States temperature, 22 million degrees. We have 90 degrees and I'm fainting. Free air condition and I'm dripping sweat. Imagine now 90 degrees become 22 million degrees. We won't have time to sweat, that's for sure. What happened to the wicked people? It's gonna be a curing sun. Ah, beautiful day. It won't burn them. Miracle! One of the last one ever. But that's it. But the Midrash, Chazal say, In the future to come, God will take the sun out of his shell. How did they know? What person was able to know 2,000 years ago that the sun has a shell? Only a person who had direct connection with God, and he told him the secrets of the creation, which is who? Only the nation of Israel, nobody else. In case you have doubts, watch Torah and science. So now, so the Gemara continues, the Gemara says, Hashem took the sun out to make sure nobody bothers him. It's the third day of his milah. What does he do? Run outside to look for guests. Who are those three angels that looks like Arabs? Michael, Gabriel, or Raphael. Three Bukharian Jews. <laughs> <laughs> you ask every Bukharian, what's your name? You expect Michael, Gabriel, or Raphael. That's the most common names. I always claim the Bukharians are all angels. <laughs> I'm not being sarcastic, I mean it. Sorry, Ilya. Next time tell your parents to call you in the right, in the right name. But Michael is the one who came to Sarah to tell her that she has a baby next year. Raphael is an angel, is in charge of medicine. After he went 17 years in Harvard Medical School, he got his diploma. Now he's in charge of all medicine in the world. 
רפאל, the angel, he came to cure Abraham after his brit milah. You know, there's a sgula in the day of a brit milah, if there's a circumcision, there's a sgula for cure, cure, for cure. Why? Because Eliyahu Navi is coming. Eliyahu Navi is coming to the Brit as a zgula to get cure. So what happened one time, there was a rabbi, he was invited to be a sandak. Uh, some rebbe, so he came to a Brit and uh, he's waiting for them to bring the baby. 20 minutes, half an hour, an hour, he asked, where is the baby? What, something wrong? They say, no. The father of the baby is between life and dead. They're waiting for him to die first. So he said, what kind of stupidity is this? The opposite. Let's quickly do the Brit Mila. Eliyahu Navi is going to be here. We all make special prayer. Maybe he's going to get cure. So quickly they changed the plane. They brought the baby. A miracle happened, and the father came back to life. And he stayed alive. Why it's gula, by the way, you should know, if you ever have a circumcision, for instance, if it was on Shabbat, on Shabbat you make it in a house, because you cannot carry the baby, taking him to places, there's an infant. So you make the circumcision, in, if you have a private house, if there's room, it's good, you make it in your home, it's very good. Three days after the Brit Milah, the house is blessed with the spirit of Eliyahu Navi. Three days the spirit of Eliyahu and Navi stay in a house, which means even when people left, the chair of Eliyahu don't rush to get it back to the shul. Leave it in the house for three days. You can sit on it, you can read Tehilim on it, because the spirit of Eliyahu and Navi stay where the Brit Mila is for three days. Then the third, the third uh, angel was Gabriel. What was his job? He go to destroy Sodom. Sodom and Gomorrah. Every angel has a job. One angel does not do two missions. Only one mission. Whenever Hashem sends an angel to do something, one mission per angel. He doesn't do two things. He does this, so he does this. And there's another angel for this, and one for this, etc., etc. Amar Mar. Listen good now. Now I'm going to tell you secrets about life. Not me, the Gemara. We're still in Masechet Baba Metzia. It's the last, the last from Baba Metzia, and then we move on to Baba Batra. The, how do you call it in English? What we take out of the nose, you know? The people who pick their nose, the things that comes out. Huh? Well, I know my wife call it boogies with the children, but what's the real name for it? Yeah. Snot? No, snot is the wet one, the dry one. There's no, what kind of Americans you are? No, 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 huh? All right, so whatever comes out of the nose and whatever comes out of the ear, right? The dirt that you clean with the, yeah. So what's, what's with this? Too much of it is not good for the health. Little, that shows that you're healthy. If you have a lot of them, something is not good with your health. If you say a lot of them in a year, something in your system is not good. But a little at a time, once in a while to clean, it's good. Then, every sickness that a person gets is not in his hands. Don't eat your heart. Oh, if I would do this, if I would eat that. I wouldn't become sick, except catching a cold. If you, go, you caught a cold, it's your ne neglection. You neglected your health, you went without a coat, you're standing in open the uh, wind, you know, air conditioned too hard, you know, you sweat and you go into the car, you put full air condition, you, may, you brought it to yourself. That's nature. Nature is nature. Any other sickness, such as cancer, kidney problem, heart problem. Heart is not because you eat tons of cholesterol. It's true that the Torah say to watch the health. Yes, but don't ever think that life and death is first about your, you know, nature, nature, the things that you do in nature, and then the spiritual, wrong. 
If there are people who never touched a cigarette, die 40. Heart attack, 50. Someone smoked 70 years, 90 years old, still walk like a lion. Yeah. You don't know, you know, it's, it's a, people with very high cholesterol live long life sometimes. People with no cholesterol, oh, all of a sudden something happened. People who jog all day in Central Park, you touch their bodies like touching a medal. There's no fat, all muscle, why all their life jogging. Oh, they cross the street, a car comes, send them to Gehenom Express. <laughs> and then a guy never, never practiced one day in his life, doesn't know what uh, to jog, to run, to lift weight. You see him walking in Borough Park, 105 years old, never jogged one minute in his life. There is nature, but Hashem is always, always come first. Now, cold, it's a different story. We have a verse that says, Tzinim pachim bederech ikesh shomer nafsho irchak mehem. Don't be stubborn and foolish. Watch your health from tzinim and pachim. Tzinim means, tzinai means cold, coldness. Stay away. Someone who watches his health should, be, should stay away from cold. Okay. Rabbi El Azar say, there is another sickness called Mara. It's a sickness called Machala. That's, by the way, in the modern Hebrew, how do you say sickness? Machala. Chole, it's a sick person. Machala, it's sickness. Here comes from this Gemara in Baba Metziah. Machala. 83 sicknesses depend on the Mara. Mara, I think in English, it's gold bladder. Gold bladder. There are 83 sicknesses who the source of them is in the gold bladder. And there is one cure for all of them. You can protect yourself from all these 83 sicknesses. How? You eat every morning bread, even one slice of bread. One ounce of bread, it's enough. You don't have bread, you eat cookies, which is also like bread. Cookies, cake. Something with a dough that was made from a dough, and drink water, remember, glass of water in the morning, half, half a slice of rye bread is already one ounce, if I remember correctly, or half a pita bread. That's already 28 gram, one ounce. You eat it, you, and it's automatically a vaccine against these 83 sicknesses. Then the Gemara say, Tanur Abanan, Shlosha Asar Dvarim Nehemru Bepat Shachrit. 13 things were said about the bread of the morning, the importance of eating bread every morning. One, it saves you from the, ha from the heat. You suffer less than in the heat. Some people, they, they can walk in the street, one is dying from the heat, one is not so much. Why is it? One of the reasons, could be other reason, could be the nature of the person. Some people are boiling all the time, even in the winter, from inside, it's like fire. Some people in their nature, they're cold, they're always cold. Even in 80 degrees outside, they, they, they're looking for a blanket. You know, so it, it's also depend on blood pressure and many other things. Also stress, person that is under stress, two or three degrees, is, the heat of his body is higher. He sweat, he suffer. But someone who's very well, his business is booming, is healthy, a million dollar was just wired to him, he sits, enjoys cigarette. What's going on? Someone like that doesn't sweat. Why? It's, it's okay, it's relaxed. But now we're talking, the, the importance of pat shachrit, of, of the morning bread. It saves from the heat. In the winter, it saves from the freezing weather. So it does two opposite things. It saves you from extra heat, it saves you from extra cold weather. It saves from the zikin, all kinds of uh, demons, and uminama zikin, which is a different kinds of demons. Machkimat peti improve the ability of the brain to understand. That's why very important before you send your kids to school, to yeshiv. if you send them to public school, don't give them bread. It's better they don't understand anything. <laughs> 
But if you send them to yeshiva, give them bread in the morning. So is it after davening? Huh? It should be after davening. After davening, yeah. So, machimat peti makes you wise, clever, wisdom. Zoche badin, if you have a court case today, it helps you to win the case. Not if you're a crook. If you're a crook, nothing will help you. You finish the whole bakery. <laughs> We're talking now, there's more chance now that the judge will like you. Right? Zoche badin. Zoche lilmot Torah ulelamed. You have better ability to learn Torah and to be able to teach Torah. When you speak, you are more charismatic. People like to hear you. Sometimes you wonder. There are two speakers. Both of them will give the exact same drasha, same speech. One gets very high recommendation, five stars, almost all the people, and the other one, one star hardly. Same exact words. And you, and you say, well, they look, they look alike, they speak the same language. Why everyone like this one and nobody like the other one? There's no way to explain this. Why? This is one of the reasons. Pachachrit. No. The Talmudom it kayem beyado. It's improved the memory. What you learn, you're able to remember also. And your flesh, your skin doesn't stink, doesn't smell. Some people, they just came out of the shower, 500 creams, two minutes later, oh, wow, smell like a dead fish. Some people came from the desert after a week with no shower, almost no smell. It's hard to understand. One of the reasons is Pat Shachrit. He's faithful to his wife. His eyes is not for other women. He's very attracted to his wife and has no need to look at other women. So it's great. So the wife should make sure a lot of bread is going to be on the table. Moshe, come. Fresh bread, hot from the oven. What happened? You're so nice. I'm taking care of my own interest. Eat, eat a lot. No, I'm full. Eat more. Come, come, I have another bread. Tell me what you think. All the whole morning is eating. Why? She's worried. He's going to the office now. <laughs> then, nah, I'm sure tomorrow a lot of guys will have to eat bread. Not tomorrow. After the lecture is going to be all, all the wives, all of a sudden, will start baking bread. What happened? Is Shabbos? Rachel? No, no, I'm making an experiment. Kill the worms in the stomach. You know, all of us almost have worms in the stomach. Sometimes the baby, you see that they, when they go to the bathroom, the worms comes out. Today they give pills. Why do you need pills? It's ten dollar each pill. Eat a piece of bread every morning, you won't need a pill. And one more opinion, but it's questionable. Everything that I said so far, it's according to all opinions. Now there is one opinion, but it's questionable. Some say, some of the Chachamim says, it takes out jealousy. If you're a jealous person, it takes out the jealousy and bring instead love to people. You're jealous, you're always angry at people. Why you got a car? I have to scratch it, I can't. I can't, you know? If you had bread every morning, Moshe! Mazal tov, great car. Wow, you should enjoy. Mwah. May Hashem give you another car. Enjoy it. Very good. What happened? Eat breads in the morning. What's the connection? Don't ask me. Go to the Western world, write a note to Hashem. Please explain what's the connection between jealousy and bread. What's the, well, memory, I can understand. It's vitamins. I guess it's, it sends the right things to the brain. So this we can understand. Uh, killing the worms, it gives the immune system probably more strength. Certain things we can explain naturally, but what's the connection jealousy? Jealousy. Same thing, jealousy. Someone who died and he wasn't a jealous person, the worms have no permission to bite from his skin. His body stay full in a grave. Why? Because the, Gemara say, the, the, the Torah says, Rekev atzamot kina. The bones, the body of a person become rotten in a grave because of one reason. What? Jealousy. Kina. You don't have jealousy? There was one Goya. Goya, non-Jew. 
She was buried for a long, long time, and then, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not, not a Goya, a Jew, but not religious. A Jewish woman buried in Russia for a long, long time, and her family, after who knows how many years, they decided to bring her body to Israel. Instead of flying to Uman every year, they decided to, to be in Israel. So what happened when, they, when I took their body out of the grave? She was complete. So the rabbi that came to rebury her, he was very, imp very impressed. He thought, oh, what a big tzaddikah. When we didn't know about her, maybe we'll make a big ad that people come to pray by her grave. Uh, she's buried for only 40, 50 years and not one hole in the body, complete. So he came to the grandchildren. Oh, who was this woman? She, she was a rabbinate. What is she? No, she wasn't even religious. Bichlal. So they came to the rabbi. Rabbi, here. There's a, something not clear in the Torah. The Torah say only people who have jealousy, the worms and the snakes eat their body. But if they don't have jealousy, the body stay full. Here is a woman, not religious bichlal. So they say so you have to investigate. They went back to the family, and what did, what did they find out? That the last 60 years of their life, she was in coma. Yeah. Since a young age, she was in coma, and then she died. 60 or 40. Uh, this, year, this story is more than 10 years old, so I don't remember the details. But mo throughout most of her life, she was in coma. When you're in coma, you don't have what to jealous with. You live in your own world. So, the Gemara, we finish Masechet Baba Metziah B'Sha'a Tova. We still have five more minutes. Let's start Baba Batra. Next week, the lecture is 8.30 sharp. Please don't be late. Today, everyone was late. It's 8.30. We're going back to winter schedule now, even though it's still August. But there is no reason now, once it gets dark around 8, there's no reason why to start late. 8.30 to 10. Then I have another lecture. So like this, I can start my other lecture earlier. <laughs> OK, now, so Amar Rabbi Asi, Shkula tzedaka keneged kol ha-mitzvot. Tzedaka, charity, is important like all the other mitzvot. Very important mitzvah. Why? Because there are many things about tzedaka in the Torah that when you review all the comments that God made about people who give charity, then you come to the conclusion that it's count like all the other mitzvot. Now is a great bonus. Great bonus. What's the bonus? If you, you are very poor, you broke, and you want to give tzedakah, you want to give charity, but you don't have. And sometimes it really makes you depressed. You like uh, your rabbi, what he's doing. You want to help him out. Uh, you know, want to wanna sponsor CDs. You want to sponsor the yeshiva where you're learning. You see the yeshiva is having difficulty. You're dying to do it. And you say, Hashem, you give me a million dollars, I promise you right away half a million I give to the yeshiva. Right away. And then the rest I'll give slowly, slowly. And you mean it. And you're planning to do it. And you don't get it. No, what's, what's going on now? What's, how is a person that is broke, that doesn't have an extra dollar a month to give tzedakah, can do more tzedakah than even someone like Bill Gates, who already gave 20 billion dollars tzedakah? How? How you can do it? You make other people give tzedakah. If you make other people give tzedakah, every money that they gave, it would count that you gave more than them. This is one of the greatest things in life. This is a gift that Hashem gave to the poor people. You don't have to give? OK, no problem. Make your friends give, which means you have a rich uncle. You come to your uncle, you say, hey, it's sick. You know, I know this rabbi, he makes CDs, he gives them for free, and people become religious. Each CD, DVD, cost him a dollar. Give me $5,000, I want to give him that he can make $5,000 for the next concert. He will give 5,000 CDs, we'll make another three, 400 Jews religious. No, yeah, it's sick. Come on, we family. Right, check, right, right. No, no. Doesn't leave him alone. Oh, you nudnik. Okay, here. Take 5,000, leave me alone. 
In Shamaim, it counts that your uncle gave 5,000 and you gave more than him. 100% literally, not metaphoric. Where is the source? Here, in the beginning of Baba Batra. Right in the beginning, the Gemara speaks about it. Amar Rabbi El Azar. Gadol ame'ase yoter min ha'ose. It's not only in charity. Every mitzvah that you make another person do, once he did it, he gets full reward for it, and you just received from Hashem bigger reward than him. You convince some guy to put tefillin, it counts like you put more than him. I don't know, one and a half time, 1.2, 1.7, 2, 5, I don't know. It's Hashem calculation. He put, for you it was better than him. You spoke to a group of 50, and they all came to you and said, okay, here, let us put, like the Chabadnik came standing in the Western Wall, another one, another one, another one. Everyone who puts this Chabadnik, it's count like he did. Another one, and another one, 5, 10, 20. So he's standing there 10 hours a day. I don't know, 200 people put. It counts for him that today he put fill in 200 times. That's it. What happens if tomorrow they continue to do after you, you know, you ignite the, the, the spark in their heart? Every time they put fill in, it's like he did. Very good investment. So, obviously, the best thing is to make a Jew religious. You don't have to talk to him about each mitzvah separately. Once you make him religious, everything is going to learn what to do. He comes, he learns Torah. Every day he sits and learns Torah. He learns one hour. It counts like you learn more than him. So every one of the people who you convince to do mitzvot, partially, fully, full repentance, partial repentance, one mitzvah a day, one mitzvah a week, whatever the case is, he becomes your salesman for life. You have override residual income from him, from his children and grandchildren for eternity. And there are so many foolish people who can do millions every day and they do nothing. How they can do? You in college, you know hundreds of people. What's the problem giving them CDs? What's the problem? Someone sent me from university yesterday an email. Would you agree to speak in my university to all my friends? Of course. Clever guy. He called me, I go, I do the job. He's going to have 50 of his friends. Five of them will become religious. Every mitzvah they'll do, go to his account. What did he do? Made one email. Finished. He got the point here or no? Or make a flyer. I have this guy from Brooklyn, Joey. He made a flyer. It's explaining a little bit about my organization, 16 years, making ballet tshuva. Everyone wants to donate on his credit card. Every dollar they will ever donate, it counts like he did. What did he do? He worked a few days on it, moving, comments, correct, fix, erase, add, change the picture. Fine, a little headache. Ten hours of work, and it's over. That's it. From now on, every time a person will give $18 a month, it's like he gave. Another person $100 a month, it's he gave. A person gave $1,000 a month, count he gave. He comes to Shamayim, he says, you are number one in the world in Tzedakah. Me? I'm broke. <laughs> I'm a student, what's Tzedakah? Moshe, Yitzchak, Avram, John, this, that, all the people who ever gave, it's your mitzvah. This is the Gemara. Gadol ha-me'ase yoter min ha-ose. You open a website, you put lectures over there. Everyone who learns now in your website, count you did. It's about time people will start to use their head. You can earn so much more. We kill ourselves to do few mitzvot a day for 70 years. We get up in the morning, we pray shachrit, one, one mitzvah. Tzitzit, two. Tfilin, three. Then we eat Birkat Amazon, another three mitzvot. No, so now we have seven. We go to the bathroom, we come out, we make bracha, eight. Wash our hands, nine. Lunch, Birkat Amazon, washing, 15. Dinner, 20. What? How many mitzvot you can do a day? 
But if you start using your head, let others do the job for you. That's what the Torah says, Melechet Tzadikim Naaset Bidei Acherim. The work of the righteous people are done by others. Two things you need. One is to be clever. You care. You really want Jews to do. And second, you have to be righteous. Why you have to be righteous? And if you're wicked, you cannot give charity. Wicked cannot convince other people. He won't have blessing. Because the Torah says, amar Hashem, ma lecha lesaper chukai. And God said to the wicked person, wicked, what, how dare you teaching my laws to others? I'm not interested in your filthy mouth. Why, why does Hashem care that the wicked person convince others to be righteous? Because Hashem doesn't want to give him this bonus. That's the whole thing. That's why you can see 100%. Two rabbis come to a wealthy Jew. One collecting for his children for food for Shabbat. So he wants $500 that he will have for this Shabbat to eat. And one wants 500 to make 500 DVD seminars and give it to secular people. 99 out of 100 fools will give to the poor family that are hungry for food. They will give them the money and will not give one dollar to the one who makes other people religious. Now, you, one, one is a fool, five are fools, 10 are fools. It cannot be 99 of them are fools. The answer is Hashem is not interested to give them this gift. You give them one meal, you give them three meals, one meal, one mitzvah. 10 people, 10 mitzvot. Another uh, suda, 10 people, 20 mitzvot. Suda shlishit, $500, got you 30 mitzvot of feeding the poor. Over. That's it. Sunday, it's a new day already. Your mitzvah is finished. Making 500 DVDs and making 50 Jews religious, <laughs> that's trillions of mitzvot goes to your account every year. Him, his children, grandchildren, his wife. He makes other people religious. He built the synagogue. He helped the yeshiva. He, you know, it's... it's a mountain of, of mitzvot goes to your account. Hashem doesn't want to give it to you. If he loves you, he opens your heart. I saw it in my own eyes a few times. I usually never waste my time going to the rich people to help me for my cause, because I know nothing comes out of it. They never give. I just saw it. Last week, I have a good friend. He told me, don't worry. Somebody owe me. I help him in Hong Kong. And I told him, okay, you made me a partner with this mitzvah. Now I have one mitzvah that I want you to be my partner. He said, partners all the way. He told me, come 4 o'clock. We'll meet in his office. <laughs> I went there. He gave me a stone to hold more than $2 million. Then he threw 20 stones on a table, each one more than $100,000. So it was all together, more $4 million right in front of me on a piece of paper. And then, not only did not give, he insulted me and his friend that is doing business with him for years, like two dogs. What was his claim? I'm telling you, first, everything was beautiful. I have to tell you this for you to understand how Hashem interfered with the free choice of these wicked people. You have to see. I go in, my friend presents who I am. He tells him I know him, I see what he does. Here, go to his website, see what's going on. See, so smiling. So far, everything looks good. But I already been in this movie. <laughs> I know how it's going to end. So I'm feeling, listening. So then he says, where are you from? I say, from Monsi. Oh, you know this guy? There's one guy sell diamonds in Manhattan. He's from Monsi. I say, yes, I happen to make him religious. <laughs> That's a very good start for a meeting, no? You come to a wealthy guy. He pull a name. 12 million people in New York. He pull a name. You know this guy? Yeah, I went to his house. He had curly hair like this. Was laying on a bed like an Indian guru. That's how he was, with all kinds of weird clothes. And I opened up his eyes, and I got him out of there, and I brought him to yeshiva. And today is Baruch Hashem, a serious religious guy. 
to learn and work. And, uh, and happened to be, it was one year my chevrut are learning with me Gemara every day, that guy. So he said to me, no, you're lying. You didn't make him religious. He told me a different name. I say, which name? He gave me a name of another person. I say to him, you know what? Why don't you put him on the phone? <laughs> put him on the phone. Nah, put him, put him on the phone. He called him up. How are you? He said, you told me that that person made you religious. Now I have somebody else. He said that he went to you and got you out of the apartment and showed you the proofs, and he brought you to yeshiva. So the guy said, well, he's right. He's right. He did all the beginning. That person that I told you, it's with the ears later. But it's true. Without him, I would never get to the yeshiva. So he said, so how is he? He said, the best. Give him. And this is a multi-billionaire. Not, we're not talking millionaire here. This is a person who makes billions. So he said, believe me, every dollar you invest, it's great for you. We talk. Everything looks great. I show him the CDs. I open him the website. I show him how many views every month. So I have to see you in action, he say. Why do you need to see me in action? I just saw you show you 700 lectures on the website. I gave you CDs. I gave you everything you want. Why do you need to come? This is how the excuses begin. All of a sudden, the Satan got into him. He got up, started to not really yell, but speaking very bad to my friend. Next time, don't surprise me with rabbis. I love rabbi. Especially this guy. I like him. I see his real. I spoke to my friend. I trust my friend. But don't, next time, don't surprise me. You tell me I have to talk to you and you bring me rabbi. I have to go now. We'll be in touch. <laughs> and it's over. Well, Akadosh Baruch Hu doesn't want to give him this bonus. Doesn't want. There's nothing you can do. If I would come to him and say I'm feeding poor people, I need $10,000, 99% he would tell me here, good luck, I'm happy to help you, no problem. Why? It's a one-time mitzvah. One, 50, 100, and it's over. Everything that is temporary, there is a much bigger merit to do. Something that is eternal residual income, almost nobody, almost nobody has the merit to give money to this cause. Almost nobody. And you always, if you don't believe, go and pre go two days of your life. One day you go to rich people, you tell them I'm collecting for synagogue. I'm collecting for poor family. I'm collecting to buy, I don't know, whatever. Whatever, everything that it's X amount and it's over. Much more cooperation. Anything that is always like a continue, continuation of, of, of uh, merit, nobody gives anything. Why is it? Because this is the way it is. When you make others make mitzvot, whether it's your money or your mouth or your fingers, you're typing messages. I always say on the Facebook, Hashem gave the Jews, those who are already there, such an opportunity to make thousands every day aware of lectures. How? You go to all kinds of lists, 50,000, 200,000, 300,000. Friends of Jonathan Pollard, I don't know, 70,000 people. 99% of them are goyim, 100% Jews, Jewish name, but have no idea what Judaism is. You put divineinformation.com, the debate between the rabbi and the priest, don't miss it. Finished. What happened? From the 70,000 people, there is 1,000 curious people. Debate between a rabbi to a priest sounds like good action. They click. Then they go into the website. They begin to listen. From the 1,000, 500 of them would shut it after 20 minutes. And the 500 would listen to the whole thing. And then from the 500, 300 would listen to another lecture. And in the end, 100 people will become religious. And how long did it take you? Exactly a second. <laughs> Finished. I have on my Facebook, in English, a guy, Muhammad. Every day he puts five, six messages since he discovered me. You know what? I think that this Muhammad, if you read his comments, it would make you more religious than my whole lecture. 
why? Because <laughs> this guy is, he say it as it is. He say, I don't understand the Jews. Why don't they make jails and put all these secular people in jail until they agree to become religious? Too much freedom to go against God. Too much freedom. You should do like in Saudi Arabia, jail, religious jail. You go there not religious, you come out religious. <laughs> they should see the comments he write. The more I learn Judaism, the more I realize how brilliant the Jewish people are. Everyone wa must watch Torah and science. Uh, now he writes it in different places. Many of the Jews are very impressed. They see someone named Muhammad, and he writes these things. It makes them more curious to see what's this Muhammad giving me Musar. He even begin to argue with some Israelis that he knows. You, what are you doing? Why you don't keep Shabbat? <laughs> now this Israeli doesn't know what to answer. Imagine an Arab guy say to you, Rasha, why don't you keep Shabbat? It's much more influence than when the rabbi come and say keep Shabbat. Because the rabbi doesn't want to hear. Ah, this guy is telling me to keep Shabbat. I guess something is, something is wrong in my head. If this guy is telling me, what did he lose? This Muhammad probably already got million mitzvot to million mitzvot to his account. Typing few names, few words, a few things every day. You can do the same thing. Everyone can do the same thing. And this is this Gemara, and we'll finish with this. Why? The act of charity will bring you peace. And the act of the charity will bring you peace of mind. Ashket vavetach adolam. Peace of mind for eternity. Where is it? Prophet Isaiah 32. For Jews, for non-Jews, everybody know the Navi. Yeshayahu 32, it's a part of the Tanakh. If everyone asks you where, where does it say that if I'm making others making mitzvot, I'm gonna benefit from it. Ve'aya ma'aseh ha'tzedakah shalom, ve'avodat ha'tzedakah ashket vavetach ad olam. You give charity, or you make other people give charity, it will bring you a peace of mind. You know what it means, ad olam? Ad olam, forever. Forever. Billions of years is not even the beginning. Ve'amar Rabbi Elazar, and in this time when the Bet HaMikdash Kayam, when the Holy Temple exists, a person pay his repentance fee and it gets, the sin is erased, which means he brings a sacrifice. Now when there is no Bet HaMikdash, now when there is no temple, if he does charity, he can get saved. And if not, the Goyim come and force him to give. But it won't count as a charity. IRS. Moshe Cohen, be in our office on Church Street next Monday at 9 o'clock. Wow, what happened? <laughs> what happened? It's an ordinary audit. Why they call you from billion people in the world? Why? Because you're cheap. Every time someone beg you, help, help. The interesting thing, I forgot. When I went to that guy for showing him to sponsor CDs, when we went out, my friend is telling me, you know where he's going? He's going now to France for two weeks vacation. But it's not vacation. No oh, vacation, everyone goes. Not vacation. He's paying $1,000 a day to lose weight. He goes to a place, they lock him in, in a paradise place, of course. They give him a very small healthy meal breakfast, lunch, dinner, but very small meals. And you're locked in. That's it, they take away your key, everything cannot come out of the place. So you are paying to be in a golden cage. A thousand dollars a day because you cannot close your mouth that you want to fress all day. But you're not gonna save your brothers and sister who, who knows where they're gonna be next week when they die. But he's gonna pay a thousand dollars a day. Why? Maybe he's gonna lose five pounds. You understand what's going on here? <laughs> that, that reminds me about that. So the, so the Akum come and they take it. And the Gemara says, the Gemara says, you should know, 
in the end, when, what you're supposed to lose, you lose. How to lose it is your choice. You gave it to yeshiva, whatever you're supposed to lose in an accident, in medical expense, in IRS problems, in all kinds of things, it came out of what you're supposed to lose. Supposed to lose a million dollars this year, and you gave 700,000 charity, you're only going to lose 300,000. And the Gemara says, Rabbi Yochanan, you know, I'm closing the computer. The Gemara says, Rabbi Yochanan had two nephews. It's in a different Gemara, but it's belong right here. And he, and he had a bad dream. What was his dream? That the king came and took away their money. So how much? 700 coins of gold. What is it like $700,000 today? That's what it is. They're going to take fee, taxes. He call up his two nephews and say to them, I need you to give charity for this cause, 683 coins of gold. So Rabbi, you're the chief rabbi of Israel. You are our uncle. We, you never ask us anything to do. If you call us and give us this amount, we know it's important, it's a lot of money, but we trust you. We give. They gave 683. One week later, they come to him to cry. Baba, I don't ask what happened. The king sent us one of his soldiers. He said that we have to give 700 coins of gold to the king. If not, they take away all our businesses. Like what we call IRS today. So he told them, don't worry. Offer that messenger 17 coins of gold to his pocket, and he will dismiss your file. Rabbi, how are you so sure? He said, don't worry. Just 17, not one more, not one less. 17, it will be fine. They went to that soldier, let's meet. Messenger, okay? We'll give you 17 coins of gold. Get off our back. Okay, quick. They gave him the coins, dismissed the file. They went back to him, how did you know? You are a prophet. He told them about the dream. So he got upset. So Rabbi, why didn't you tell us to give the whole 700 to the yeshiva? Why we lost $17,000 to this guy? It would, we would give. He said, no, I wanted to see if the dream was true or not. How do I know? If I tell you the whole 700, I never know. Now I know exactly 683 you gave, you still Guilty of losing 17 more. And when I told you, that's how I knew to give him 17. What do we learn from this Gemara? What you're supposed to lose, you lose anyway. You might as well not lose it. Give it to the right investment. That when you leave this world, you will have savings that will benefit you in the afterlife. We'll see you Bezrat Hashem next Wednesday, 8.30. All the lectures are going back to 8.30 now, Bezrat Hashem. Also the Monday one. Bye, bye.